That sounds good. Okay. If you were to sit down and, and write a dictionary definition of, of your music, how, how would you describe it? Uh, I guess I would describe my music as a sort of uh, hillbilly jazz with a touch of swing and rockabilly. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can you remember your first exposure to the to the music that was uh, inspiring you at that at, at a young age? Yeah, at, um, my my as a World War Two veteran, so we had a lot of records from the thirties and forties and fifties in our record collection, you know. And uh, I was really into uh, Bob Wills and also. Uh, uh, Lynn Miller and Calum Basie and guys like that. You know. and, and what Dan was Kenton. what was it about those sounds that, that really attracted you? Oh, just good music. <laughs> Made me feel good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the stuff that everybody else was, that I remember being on the radio back then just didn't move me. You know? Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of weird. That's how it was. Was music always a career uh, goal for you? Um, yeah, kind of. I always wanted to play music, you know. Um, other than my time that I was in the military, I've pretty much been singing. You did. You spent some time in the Marines before your music career got started. Was that a frustrating time in terms of uh, putting what you really wanted to do on hold? No, because I, I wanted to join the Marines. I wanted to get out of the little town out there. You know, it turned out to be a pretty good duty station. I was over in Hawaii, you know, and uh, I got to meet a lot of people and uh, play for a lot of people. Even I was playing music then, too. I was just in the Marine Corps, uh -huh. you know, but I didn't really uh, start doing anything with musically till the uh, 90s, you know. I mean, I was back, actually, you know, actually taking a band out on the road, so to speak. Yeah. I guess you were um, a relatively late starter in, in terms of getting into a music career. Uh, do you think in hindsight that was an advantage for you, that you were better prepared? Yeah, probably. I think that was, it probably worked out good for me, you know. There was a, a stage show that you were part of uh, there uh, back in the old days before uh, your music career really got going, a show called Chippy. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, Chippy, the, uh, the Diaries of a West Texas Whore <laughs> <laughs> was the name of the, was basically what the flavor, West Texas Hooker or whatever. Um, it was basically a triple X theater production about guys that were working in the oil fields and getting drunk. And it was a, this woman's diaries. It was a real woman who was a, a prostitute back in the, I guess back in the early year, or again, would have to be your 1900s, you know. Yeah. But, you know, back around those times, and it was just all these diaries she kept, the different stories and stuff. And I was just, uh, I was an extra in a couple of scenes. And but uh, they, uh, they, the people that were putting the play on, they were all friends of mine that I, I knew from around Austin, and uh, they needed somebody to come in and sort of. Be while they're doing blackout, changing the scenes. Have somebody come in and sing a song or something, you know. And Jimmy, uh, yeah, Jimmy Doe Gilmore had been the guy that had been doing that, but he was up for a Grammy that year. I think that was in '93, you know. And he was up. It was '93 or '94. I can't remember, but he was up for a Grammy that year, and uh, so he wasn't able to make it. So I actually took the the song that Thunderstorm that I wrote and they put it in the play, you know. Which was pretty cool. Yeah. But yeah, it was fun. It was a fun show. It was, uh, I wouldn't want my parents to see it, but it was fun. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know it, was, it was triple X, but you know, everybody's wearing body suits and stuff like that. But yeah. it was very suggestive, very dark, deep stuff, man. You know, <laughs> heavy duty, out there, you know, type of play. You know, it's like, geez. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was fun. <laughs> Your your first album um, got a lot of attention and great great reviews. That must have been a great confidence booster for you, giving you a real shot in the arm at such an early stage of your career. Yeah, it was good. Um, 
I think I spent like a week or something on my first record. I don't know if I spent a week. It would seem like a really long time. You know, I can't get them hanging out like three days. It's been a little bit, four or five days got that album. But yeah, it came out really good, didn't it? Sure did. One person um, that writers will often compare you to is, is the great Hank Williams, which is a great honor indeed. Uh, but uh, do comparisons like that put a little bit of pressure on you to, to live up to something? No, because I'm, I'm not a member of Hank Williams' family. If I was Hank Williams III or Hank Williams Jr., that, that might have been the case. But I'm Wayne Hancock. I have no ties to those people, you know. It's... Uh, it's cool to sound like Hank Williams, but at the same time, as you learn later on, you get older, that it's also, um, it, you have to be careful how you present your music. You can't sound too much like, you know, too much like uh, somebody that you like. Yeah. Already, he, he's, already, he's already been and gone, man. And I can't make no uh, record. I can't make a living off doing his songs. True. You know, so I learned over the years that, you know, you just kind of have to, take that sound and develop your own, you know, from it. So, but yeah, it's, uh, I always like Hank Williams. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of worse people I can think of being re referred to than being Hank Williams. You, know? <laughs> you, you have stayed true to your sound. Uh, you haven't gone, uh, been tempted to commercialize your sound for the sake of bigger record sales. And I guess, um, this wouldn't provide you with a bigger audience, but I'm sure it'd provide you with a more loyal audience. Oh, what's that again? I'm sorry. I didn't catch that. You've stayed true to your sound. You haven't um, tried to commercialize it at all to, to, to sell more records. But I, And even though that probably oh, doesn't, yeah. Yeah. Doesn't, doesn't give you a bigger audience, but I'm sure it gives you a more loyal audience. Yeah, yeah. My, I, have a, I have a pretty loyal audience. Um, you know, they're, they're uh, I mean, they've been, some have been following me for, you know, going on 15, 20 years, you know. And, uh, but I have a, because I don't have to play games with musical formats on how I record my albums, I can reach out to, a, I have more freedom to reach out to the, a better audience, man. Yeah. Yeah, and to tell, you, to tell you the truth, it would be the kiss of death for somebody like me to go mainstream. Absolutely. You know? Someone you've worked extensively with. Um, You've worked extensively with producing your records is Lloyd Maines. Tell, tell us how you first came in contact with Lloyd and, and how would you describe your working relationship with him? I met Lloyd uh, when I was doing Chippy, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, we got to be friends and stuff, and we recorded Thunderstorm kind of Neon Science for that uh, little Chippy album and stuff. I got to be good friends with him, and uh, I knew he was a, a, a very well known steel player out of. Love it. He played on a lot of records over the years. You know, he's a famous guy. So I wanted him to be on my album. I, I knew he'd be a good good at producing it. You know, and uh, one thing about Lloyd is he he uh, he hears what I think. You know, that's uh, that's real important. So as a producer, that's the main thing he brings to the table for you. Yeah, he he. Uh, he knows how to mix, and he knows he knows how to get the, that good sound. You know, there's a there's a real honesty in your recordings, a, a real true to live sound. How, how much do you strive for that live authenticity in, in the studio? Well, we just record live. <laughs> That's what they achieve. You know, <laughs> I mean, I mean, it, it's it's real. It's not it's complicated. We actually just put everybody in the room, and then I stand in a. <laughs> A separate room where the, I can see everybody in the band, mm -hmm. and I got a you know I got my just like it's everybody's got their heads sets off. Usually, uh, I don't really like wearing a headset. I just like record and hear, listen to what's coming over the, the speaker, you know. But um, you know, also out there, and then they they run a line from everybody's uh, amp goes into another room. So if something gets messed up, if they have to fix it, they can go back and fix it. Yeah. So everybody has separate mixes, but you know, we cut live just like we do at a regular show, you know, and then we do <clears throat> um, usually three to five takes of every song. If it's really good, we only do three. If it's, you know, or if it's really quick and maybe we do five, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do like 50 cuts a day, you know, and stuff to get a record done, you know, but man, I can bang out an album in 
a day and a half. <laughs> I'm done with it. You know, I mean, you know, these people master it and stuff, but I think mastering takes a few hours. It's, it's you know, it's boy knows how to master it. I told him, I said, I want everything out front where you can hear it. You know, I hate it when you listen to a, a, re- a recording or something, the compression's so high, you can't hear the leads, you know? Yeah. They got them so far in the back that it, it's painful to try to listen to them. You've kept pretty good control of your career, looking after a lot of the, the business side of things yourself, and the advantages of that are obvious, but are there any disadvantages and drawbacks to, to doing that? Yeah, if you, uh, when you're doing your own business, you're limited <clears throat> on what you can do. I mean, there's, if, you know, um, I guess, you know, I haven't, I haven't had any luck with management. Man. Every time I get a manager, they're always a swindler or con artist. They always want to take a bigger cut than I think they should, and they never do shit for me. Oh, excuse me, I should have said that word. That's all right. Interview. They never do, not, never do nothing for me, you know. And I would think a good manager is somebody that you could you could hire, and they would know how to promote you and, and get you where you need. I'm just, uh, I'm kind of old and set. I'm not old, old, but I'm getting near 50. I'm, I'm set in my ways. I've been doing it a long time. I like to drive. You know, I like to drive my van. Well, I like that, that living out of a suitcase kind of lifestyle, so I'm kind of happy where I'm at, you know. I think that anything more would be uh, a little too much, you know. I mean, I wouldn't want to be, I hate tour buses, man. I mean, i not not knocking them down or anything, but I personally, I don't like being on them. It's just still a bus. Yeah. You know, I like being on a van. Yeah, of course, on a bus, you can ride a luxury and you damn well better because you can only stop certain places you know on a tour bus a big old bus on a little van man you can stop anywhere you want to stop you know <laughs> to go down any road you want to go down do anything you want to do you know so i paid my dues on the tour bus I, I prefer the driving you know so it appears that life on the road is something that really agrees with you yeah yeah i love i love being on the road man how would you describe a typical Wayne Hancock fan? Oh, what's that? What? A, typical what? A typical Wayne Hancock fan. How would you describe them? Oh, a fan? Um, well, it kind of depends. I mean, some of them are some of them are as old as um, 80. Some of them are as young as 19, you know? We get a lot of uh, fathers and sons and grandfathers at our shows, but mainly a lot of we get a lot of. Uh, I don't. They're not necessarily kids; they're in their twenties at our shows, you know. Yeah. And then we have a uh, middle age. It goes right off the line because it's the kind of music that if, if your dad, if your dad liked that kind of music and you kind of like the kind of music, then you got something in common, you know. Yeah. So we see a lot of like, uh, you know. Uh, Twenty and thirty year olds with their with their parents there, you know, and everybody's everybody's into it, you know, they're all having fun. It's a good, you know, it's a good day. You know, come when we play, and here in the states, I mean, I, got, I carry a five piece band here in the states now, and you know, I got steel guitar and two leads, and myself and the doghouse bass. And we we play anywhere from uh, two hours to you know anywhere from ninety minutes to right, you know. Has it been uh, difficult over the years to, to find uh, like-minded musicians with the same love of the same style of music that you want to play? Um, yeah. I mean, it, you want to find people that are have the same kind of interest you do. Otherwise, it's going to be hard to, to get them to, to play what you want them to play. You know, I've, I've tried. I Generally, I don't fish for so-called people that play country music, I, I fish for people that play like better school than jazz, you know. Mm. And there's different kind of jazz. There's new jazz and old jazz. I like old jazz, you know, like the, and I like the, I like Django Reinhardt's style playing. I like stuff like that, man. You know, did Jimmy Bryant, you know, uh, and then, you know, guys like Mighty, you know, Dave Biller. I like, I love people, you know, <laughs> three variations, you know. I love good playing. You know, I, I don't like, uh, I hate it when you find guys, like, see drummers, like, I play country or rock. 
<laughs> what does that mean, man? You know, can you swing? <laughs> they get off my stage. You know? <laughs> That's funny, though. You do you do play very much for the love of the music. There's no motivation for fame and fortune. Do you think many artists lose begin with those intentions but uh, lose focus after a while? Well, you know what? I, I don't know. I, I don't really know that many artists that are... I mean, the ones I know that are pretty well famous, they seem to be going pretty well. Um, I... Uh, <laughs> I would like to get some fortune someday in my life, you know. It's nice <laughs> being famous. It'd be nice to have some fortune to go along with it, you know, yeah. not always, you know, dreading tax time and, you know, paying out tax and all this stuff, you know. But I don't, you know, I mean, I guess if you got really super rich really super fast and maybe you never had that much money, yeah, they hit you all at once, then it maybe, you know, it could change your, you know, we've seen a lot of people, right, they get, big record deal they, they do that first record it's a hit and then the record company changes their music and you never hear them again you know I I uh I, I uh, saw what that was like and I didn't want a part of it man you know yeah you know I, I was made that offer too to, by some people a long time ago in LA that you know told me that hey this is my chance to you know step into the, the business you know what was involved wasn't worth, to me, it wasn't worth it. I don't care how much money I would have made. I would have been embarrassed about my, about my product. It's just not worth it to me. You know? sure. Now, I believe you had a, um, a pretty what serious... Was uh, it? Yeah, I believe you had a pretty serious accident last year. Are you all healed up now? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm healed up now. I... I got in a uh, pretty good motorcycle wreck last year. Uh, it was my fault too. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't I wasn't drinking or nothing like that. wasn't anything like that. But it was a uh, on a when you're on a motorcycle, if you're going pretty fast, you get something they call the wobbles. You know. Yeah. And the, I was on a I was on a I was on a back road. You know, not a not a major highway, and it was real skinny and there was a was real narrow and there was traffic coming at me and I had to make a choice you know and if I'd been on the road by myself I, I could have bought it down and got under control but I, I didn't have that that opportunity yeah, I'd have to take the Harley to the ditch you know Harleys don't like ditches man you know? <laughs> then I went airborne yeah I, I messed myself up real good but I'm all healed up now oh that's good that's good. Now, before I let you go, uh, you, you got your upcoming tour of Australia. Uh, the band that you're bringing with you is the same band as uh, last time you were here? Uh, close to. I got to the myself and the same bass player. I got a different guitar player, but y'all going to love them. Yeah, for sure. And what, what's on your books for the rest of the year after you leave us? What's that? What, what, what other plans have you got for 2015 after you leave Australia? Uh... I still can't. Hold on, let me try it. Different years. I still can't hear, brother. Try it again. So, the, your plans for the rest of the year after you leave Australia? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Of course. I'm. Uh, I go to California after I get back from Australia, and then uh, then I'm just on tour around the around the country. Uh, the road trip continues. Yes, sir. It never quits. That's fantastic. Retirement is not in my creed. <laughs> not on your list of things I'm to do <laughs> that's right <great. laughs> hey Wayne thanks so much for your time we're really looking forward to seeing you down here again you bet man and we'll, we'll see you real soon no problem I guess next month we'll be down there that's right uh, yeah, yeah. not next month March yeah, March yeah. Yeah. fantastic we'll look forward to it alright brother you take okay. it easy thanks for your time uh, yes yeah, so you too bye okay, bye